Hello to your touch designers. This is uh, Stefan Kraus, MX10, and this is, as promised, the recording of the workshop that happened during the Touch Designer Summit 2018 in Berlin on the 4th of February. And as we had problems with the recording on location, this uh, is me trying to reconstruct what happened. For you to watch offline, you will also find um, a zip file with the project and the materials um, in a link and let's dive into it. Basically the idea was um, to create a scene with um, well, pretentiously called voxels, uh, little blocks that can be positioned in space and um, the use for that would be like a very simple to edit scenography. Um, the idea for the workshop comes from these two projects where I applied this me method that I'm going to describe. Uh, one was here for the uh, Apollo European um, Design Award 2017 where I um, created these different scenographies for uh, over 30 different collections. Um, looks a little bit like that. Animated. Basically, the task was to have uh, many very different scenarios fitting to the collections, and this method allowed me to have a consistent aesthetic, but uh, still um, very much react to the style of um, the collections. The other project that um, inspired this workshop was uh, projection mapping that I produced last year, and I tried to uh, make almost everything in Touch Designer. Um, the resolution was 4096 uh, by 700 pixels and um, well, I gathered some experience in how to make um, real-time, or in that case not real-time anymore, but offline rendering is touch designer, uh, how you have to manipulate the um, parameters so you get results that, um, given you find a good aesthetic, can somehow be accepted. So we're going to look at something like this, uh, which is kind of like a topography generator, um, which can lead to this forms or can be used to create like this kind of stage situation. Let's go into Touch Designer and start out with a clean slate. Uh, lay down a container which we're going to hold the whole thing. Let's call this voxels. Uh, dive into it and um, to start with, we just place down an out top. Out top. Um, go up and send this into no. And the next thing we should do is we're going to split the workspace, make this a bit smaller, make this like a top viewer, uh, and select this null. So then in the future we're going to see our output uh, in this area of the screen. Um, we also need to disable that this shows up in this background because I find it irritating. So we go right click, display, um, check off backdrop tops. And also, so um, we always keep the final output here. We, um, so the link, so when we jump in here, it still shows the output. Um, so now we want to create something that we can actually see. We're going to start out with a uh, traditional render setup consisting of, um, and you can hold down control to select several things at a time, uh, a camera, a geometry, a light, and a render. 
and that's it for now. Um, I like to arrange it like this, connect this to the output, and um, here we get our preview. Let's continue immediately and st yeah, start to create our cube, with which we're going to work in the future. So delete the torus and lay down a box. So add a texture sub and turn on the render and the display flag. So here we got the cube. It got a dimension of 1 by 1 by 1 um, which is what we're going to work. Next thing uh, we want to do is uh, we want to create a grid sub. And uh, activate it and press W so you can see uh, a wireframe. And as we are aiming at rendering a 16 to 9 image in the end, um, we should give this uh, aspect ratio, which is also by 16 to 9. Um, so we're going to make it 32 by 18 which is double of 16 to 9, and um, we're going to give it 32 columns and 18 rows. Um, so we get square uh, equidistance. And the thing now is we want to have an image which is 32 by 18 wide, and we have the according divisions, but what we should not forget is that our cube has a size of 1, and that is going to be placed with its middle on the point where the edges meet at the vertex, and um, that means that to the size that we're going to see later on each side, there's 0 0.5 added. That's why we actually should change the size to 31, which is 32 minus 2 times the cube, and the same is true for um, the height, where we should go to 17. Next thing we do is we um, run this through a SOP to chop to convert it to um, chop data. Um, this should give us 265 samples. Uh, 567 samples, um, which is this number by this number, um, which is the, the amount of cubes that we're going to have when we start instancing this stuff. Um, this we're going to run into a merge job because um, later we're going to add other values and then all of them are going to be collected in the merge. Um, we run this into a null, and this null is what we're going to use for instancing um, of this geo. Um, so whatever we do in front, we can always keep exporting from our null. Um, select the geo and go to the instance page, turn instancing on, and just drag the null into this feed, uh, field, and now you can select here for these channels um, the values coming in from our grid. Now um, it's time to zoom out with the camera a little bit so we get an overview. <coughs> and when we set the zoom right, we basically properly fill image which will later allow us to blend from a full image into the skew world. Now a good way to test if this um, did everything right is to go back in and change the size a little bit and see if the stuff is really close together and it is. So let's reset that to 1. We're happy here. But what we can do as we are here um, because we also want to be able to put a texture on all of those cubes, so an image from 
well, if we want to use this as a transition, for example, we will come as a clean image, we want this mapped cleanly onto the cubes. And for that, we have to manipulate the texture. Because right now, if we put um, a texture onto this, um, it would be... Maybe it's best we look at it. So we create a, a Fong material, um, which we give to the Geo material. And for now, we're going to use a sample image. Um, we get through a movie file in, and well, we've got this beautiful banana here, so we may as well use it. So I use it as diffuse map, and you see what happens is that because each of the cubes has a U and a V texture uh, value of one, uh, each of them gets the banana once full. What we need to do to be able to map the banana as we see her here, over all those different cubes, is to give each of the cubes just a fraction of the overall U and the overall V value. So this one needs to get 32 different fractions, this one 18 different fractions. So the way we achieve this is uh, by going back into the geo, uh, going to the texture, and link these values, scale u and scale v, of the single cube uh, to the amount of points that we have. And we do so by uh, going up and getting the values from here. So we have um, 32 columns, 18 rows, so that means we drag the columns onto the U scale. Um, so now that would be linked. That's exactly the opposite of what we want. Uh, we want 1 divided by that number because U the value goes from 0 to 1. So 1 needs to be divided by the amount of cubes in that direction. And the same thing we do for the V value that also needs to be divided. So now we have set this up properly, but uh, unfortunately we still don't see what we want to see. And the reason for that is that we now need to feed the instances, again, which part of the image they're going to show. So here we tell the texture that it is the 32nd part or the um, 18th part of the whole image. and with um, channels, we have to tell the instances which of these cubes they are. Um, so the way we do that is that we go back up. And basically, we already got the UV coordinates because they're very similar to the TX and the TY value. So we split this off with a select. Um, and first we get our U values. For that we are only interested in TX. Um, as we are here we rename it to U. And when we look we see that um, this goes from um, I think minus 15.5 to plus 15.5. Um, the numbers should be like that because the thing is no, I'm sorry, 17 pixels high, uh, uh, 31 pixels wide. When we divide that by 2 is 15.5, the thing starts at 0, so it goes minus 15.5 in that direction, plus 15.5 in that direction. And that is interesting for us because we run this now through a math where we take go to the range page and it chain, uh, say the incoming range is from minus 15.5 to 15.5 and the two range stays 0 to 1 so basically this is normalized that's how we need it, it's already called U um, so we can merge this in the merge make this look a little bit nicer um, 
merge. So now we get a U coordinate, and now we have to repeat a similar process to come to the V coordinate. Um, as it's similar, we can simply copy this one and change it here from Tx to Ty. Um, rename it to V. And now um, we see this has a value range from um, 8.5 minus 8.5 to plus 8.5. So we change this to minus 8.5 to plus 8.5. Whoops, it's again normalized and we can feed it into the merge where is now uh, provided for the instances. And on page instance page 2, we can now uh, select the U and the V. And here's the banana. Banana is a bit pixeled. Um, that is because we have selected to replace the UV coordinates. Um, what we need to do is to offset them. And now we have a clear image of the banana, but which is spread out over um, our 576 cubes. So what we actually want to do is now to be able to change the position of these cubes in depth. Um, and for now we should turn off the texture um, because it is kind of in the way where we want to see. Um, one thing that we can add now, which will also help us to see what happens in depth. Um, well actually we can do that later. So what, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to create another channel which will allow us to give each of the cubes a position in that space. And because we want to also that very easy, we're going to do that with a bitmap. So let's put down a ramp. And uh, we're going to give that ramp a resolution of 32 by 18. Um, we're going to change this to the nearest pixel, so there's no interpolation. But each pixel is a clean pixel, otherwise um, it looks like this, which we don't want. And um, as we want to add more different maps later, we're going to run this uh, into a switch. And we're going to run this into a null. Whoops. And this null um, we run into a uh, top to chop, which will convert the image here uh, into a set of channels. We're only interested in black and white information. So basically, we can turn off the other channels. Just take the red. It will hold just the brightness information. Um, we leave this as it is and we select the crow because momentan at the moment it just uh, selects one row um, but we want it to analyze the full image. Now we get like these uh, channels uh, for every pixel and we need to run them through a shuffle to sort them in a way that they are suited for instancing. Um, the way would be to sequence the channels by name. And now we get um, this, we get like 576 values between 0 and 1, which um, tell us how deep these blocks shall become. Um, as we come from another value range, we want to add a mass chop. So we can later uh, manipulate how deep uh, a black and how deep a white point is. Um, let's call this depth. And also add it to the merge. 
so we can use it for instancing. Now uh, let's go back to page one and replace the tz value with um, the depth. We see something tiny has happened, but um, because here the range is just between uh, zero and one, and we have here like a 3D space that is really not much distance covered here, so we use the mass node the range to find the range um, with which we want to work. Obviously we want to keep um, the cubes on one side on the front. Let's think of it as the screen. So we want to keep be able to keep them at the screen. And the other cubes we want to move back in space. So not in front of the screen but behind the screen. So let's see what happens. So, so basically now we uh, define one end of the spectrum, let's say we go down until minus 50, and these cubes they stay on screen level. Um, it is not so easy to see now what's happening in space, so we can introduce our first um, shiny effect, and that would be the SSAO, Screen Space Ambient Occlusion which um, is good that we do it first because it has to be immediately after the render node. Um, the other thing is it's eating up very much performance um, so you have to be quite careful with the settings. The thing is if you have very low settings it looks very bad. My recommendation is to configure it to um, turn off combine this color. Um, I would here go for full SSAO pass resolution. And what it does is basically uh, from the depths that it knows the objects have um, from the camera, it um, fakes an ambient occlusion look. So basically, where in the scene would get less light. And you can adjust how far it sees here with the radius. So now we cover the whole range of our scene. Um, later, you will want to crank up these settings, but if you crank them up too much, they will definitely not be real-time anymore. Um, I tend to turn down the blur because it doesn't really make the situation better. If you turn it down, you see that um, we have these artifacts, that's what go in a way when you crank up the values, but that also uh, will pretty soon do something to your frame rate. So maybe depending on your GPU, don't follow me immediately. But you can do quite a bit so that it doesn't look horrible and it will definitely help uh, the image to look, um, let's say, a lot more spatial and rendered than without. So I like to turn it on already during authoring. Um, so it just seems a bit more understandable what is in front and what is in back. The next thing which will help us to get like an idea of the space is uh, to adjust the light. And I find that lights with shadows are best controllable when they're cone lights. So we're going to make this a cone light. We turn the shadows on to see what we're doing. And we see that we need to widen range, make the light a bit softer, um, and to get more depth we have to move the light a bit on the axis, so that okay, and we can move it away a little bit. The further we move it away, the um, more pixelated the shadows become, that's because it's working with shadow maps, and that's why it's good to use the cone light, because you can limit a bit the um, yeah, the range. Uh, later, later when you render, render, you can still go and uh, crank up the settings of the, the resolution of the, of the shadow. So basically I um, tend to go to 4K. It just makes uh, the anti-aliasing situation better. So, so now we can have a look at uh, what actually happens. So we have uh, this ramp here. We see that the uh, cubes are um, 
transformed back into space and depending on the kind of information we give in um, we can move them smoothly through space uh, with this information coming from this image which allows us to um, create have a very easy way to author this kind of more complex animation. The thing is, uh, as we use this as position data, so we take a very small value range and pump it up, it's um, a good idea to make this 32-bit because it will allow you to get much smoother positioning when you animate the whole thing later. So now what we want uh, is a nicer way to author the depths of these cubes. Um, what I would like to do is to be able to paint them basically and to do this in real time we can use the uh, Photoshop in node um, and to do that we need to go to Photoshop edit preferences additional modules need to activate generator uh, activate remote uh, connection and give it a password I used uh, TD Summit 18 um, the connection should then be established when we have a new document. We're gonna make it 32 pixels wide and 18 pixels high. Uh, it's gonna be 8 bit RGB and do it. There we go. And we're gonna save this as. Um, depth map live PSD. I already got one. Um, now we need to establish the connection here. We're gonna type in the password. Um, let's change this to uncompressed RGB and set the update to 1. Automatic. And here we already got Photoshop incoming. Uh, we wire this to the switch. Um, blend over and um, switch back to Photoshop. Windows left. Uh, splits up the screens. And um, now we can start to paint our pixels. Um, and what is also always very nice is like the gradient tool. make a new layer gradient and you see that uh, the effect it has over here is so basically um, you can start doing all kinds of things with the cubes I'm going to make this a bit bigger so you see what's going on um, and the nice thing is really that um, all the changes are updated in real time and you can see what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately the light setup is not to the best here so let's just save this. Uh, obviously you can then uh, save different um, versions of this just as regular pictures and then later use them to uh, seamlessly blend between uh, different architectures. Uh, let's adjust the uh, lighting a little bit so we can see better what's going on. Um, so
So now um, the thing is that uh, as the cubes just have a depth of one, the whole thing looks still more like holes. So we see a lot of background. And uh, to change that, um, I'm going to change the geometry of the cube to um, something more like a stick, which has depth. Uh, we're going to make it very long, like 40 and move the center back uh, minus 20 so that we, we again at screen level um, so now um, the cubes are building kind of walls on the sides um, and we can also adjust the SSAO to the new conditions by playing around with the settings a little bit. Okay. And not too much. Okay. So I don't really like that room too much. So what I'm gonna do is play a bit more with it. Um, let's see how this looks if we invert the whole thing. Yeah, that's a nice stage. Um, that's a whole different game. So let's make a little bit of ceiling here and there and add a bit of wall to the side. Yes. Let's go over here a little bit. Uh, take a turn there this and maybe this should um, then not be so much on the forefront no. Let's see. Bit more like that what happens here yeah that's good okay this one is cool. Uh, here should something happen. So, um, as we have this, um, this is already something we can work with. Uh, obviously, we can now um, also seamlessly go from this to any other form that we put in as an image. Um, and obviously, we can also um, animate the whole thing. So. Something like that could be nice if we add like a beat here uh, and plug that into the face. Uh, then we start seeing interesting things happening here. Good, but um, actually that's not our main focus. Let's keep this um, quite. That's not our main focus. So, but that's not really our main focus. So s let's switch this uh, back to the uh, scenography, pseudo scenography that we um, just created. And um, next thing I would like to do is to be able to do the same thing with colors. Um, obviously we can and we will do later work here with textures but um, also very nice uh, thing you can do is just to work with um, colors for the single cubes um, and to that end we basically gonna make a copy of this whole setup here um, oops, oops, oops. 
whoops. Um, and in this case, we want the whole uh, RGB information. Right now, it's still just black and white, but um, we're going to change that soon. We don't need to rename the whole thing because they are called R, G, and B, and that's how we're going to use them. And we also wire that into the merge. So now we have these channels um, available for instancing, and we can use them here in the color mode on the instance page 2. So just wire the R, the G, and the B to the according channels. Um, I now, let's say, add. No, let's say multiplier. This is not very exciting yet. I'll replace. Um, because this is basically the same thing here, but let's see what happens if we switch here over to the ramp and we give this whole thing a bit of color. Let's give the whole thing a bit of color. So One nice thing that I find uh, by working with Touch Designer is uh, that if you work with these generative colors, they're incredibly intense, especially on an LED wall. So um, as nice as the whole black and white stuff is, uh, one of the things that you can achieve with Touch Design is these really crisp colors. And I find you see immediately when you play a however encoded movie file on a wall, or if you play directly, plain colors uncompressed from the graphics card. Um, it's just a lot more brilliant, I find. So uh, now we've got this color input, but it doesn't look like we want it to be. Uh, probably because we have this math thing here, which we copied um, accidentally from the other chain. So let's just show this away. And now we see that we can color our place um, pixel by pixel. Let's turn on, switch this also to nearest pixel. Uh, this too, so we get like this nice pixelated look and now interpolation. Um, and obviously now we can do the same thing with Photoshop to create a color map. So let's jump over and set this up. Um, we can reuse the depth map basically, which makes sense because we here already have the places of the things in space. Um, so we save this as color map live. Uh, I'm going to go and flatten this whole thing and start to play around a bit with the color. Um, so just so we see a difference, uh, let's connect this here to the other document. Um, it's called color map live PSD, so we can also write this in here. Write it right. And as always, it's not really doing what it's supposed to do.
So um, you can write the name of the document that you want to drag from Photoshop in here, and then you can lock the documents. Now this has yeah good clipped. Lock it. So we've got the connection from the color map. Um, the connection with the depth map is still here. So I'm going to switch over to uh, Photoshop incoming. Um, I don't completely understand why it's not so dark. some color here. I mean I'm obviously doing this very stupid now just so something happens but I think you see that you can create scenes uh, in quite spontaneously and um, not too much detail but there's stuff possible. Save this um, again. Here you can create basically for every uh, yeah, countless versions of color and depth settings, and save them as images, and then use something like a movie file in um, to make it look. Nice. So here I change everywhere the interpolation to nearest pixel. I'm not sure the doesn't really change something in the output, but I um, just like to see what's going on, really. And I can see that more than when it's uh, cooked uh, to a blurb. So, um, as we've got this set up, we can introduce um <coughs> another bit of uh, eye candy. Um, I like to apply a little bit of um, edge to give this thing a bit of an outline look. Um, unfortunately, the edge also catches the shadows um, if you do it with luminance, and that's basically the most effective uh, thing. Um, comp it over the input and then make the settings very light, so that basically is just on the edge of not being there, but then it gives uh, some nice glowing edges to things and, and a slightly cartoonish look. Um, another thing that we can do to give this whole thing a bit more life would be to give it a background as feedback. Um, we we'll see the advantage of that soon, so let's add after the render a feedback. Uh, node, um, a transform node, and uh, uh, level, and uh, add this as a composition after the SSRO before the edge, so somewhere here, insert a comp posit node, and um, make a small beautiful later at the level in there with um, an over Let's see do we have this in the right order yeah I think so um, the feedback should be under the render coming from the SSRO and um, now for the feedback to uh, become effective we need to give it this comp as a target 
it and also here in the transform node we're gonna turn tile on repeat uh, and we're gonna scale uh, the whole thing up a tiny bit also again really small amount so we get this very slow expansion of the feedback um, so um, this will also have a nice effect when the whole thing moves. Mm. Let's give it a bit of animation. So you see the stuff that's coming in there is um, then slowly traveling towards us and extends the perspective that is already there. that uh, I like it when there's a bit of color. So at this point um, we could have a little bit more look at the material. So for now this is a very very simple material. We know we can make it have a banana at any moment when we want, but that's not really what we want right now. Um, we can have a look at how this uh, reacts when we play around with the values of the material. Uh, for example, if we give it like a full white, it becomes more powerful. Uh, one thing that I like to play with is uh, rim lights. Rim lights are a very simple method to give. Um, the impression of lighting um, in the material and it's like the rim light comes from a certain direction. Um, I'm going to give this a bit more um, bit light. One thing, the default yellow here is always a bit much on the greenish side. I highly recommend to change that to be a bit on the red side. It's a much nicer yellow. Um, so basically we can give like one side of the scene a certain light. Also you can use this to um, simulate something like indirect lighting. If you have like here this yellow light on the sides and here you have a very strong yellow wall, that looks like that would be indirect lighting. We're not as systematic today. I'm just going to take two kind of opposed colors uh, to create a dynamic in the scene. So I really like the rim lights. Um, you can achieve uh, different effects if you turn uniform alpha on and take away, for example, the alpha front, then disappears, or the alpha side, and then maybe just very tiny dose of that can make up for a more interesting image because the edge just gets slightly blurry. But for now, let's keep this. Um, but it's always good if you go through the parameter pages just check out what happens at different things and if it looks better than before then that's something where you should maybe look into it um, Another thing that we can play around with is uh, depth. Um, so you can create a depth node, and if you feed that with the name of a render top, it will create a depth, um, a Z view basically of the scene. Um, you need to change it to can change it to 8-bit fixed RGBA and 
the depth space uh, we go to rearrange from camera space and then basically through this values you can define in which range the depths will be translated the distance from the camera will be translated into white values so this is also basically a bit of question of manual adjustment uh, to get the best use of the available depth space and then there's um, different uses we can make of that so for once we could use it as um, a kind of like a volume light so to do that I would insert a composite node here um, feed it map change this to input one um, and change this to add so now we basically should insert a luma level here to have better control over how dark this is but now we can basically have light that's beaming into the scene from behind which you can adjust on uh, various levels uh, almost like a, a volume light Uh, the other thing that we can do with it um, is we can use it to give the whole scene a depth blur. Now, those two don't. It's a bit hard to understand what's going on when both of them are active at the same time, so I'm going to disable this for now. Um, and we're going to take another output here. And. Create a composite node and uh, we drag an output from here and uh, select a luma blur operator. And the luma blur uh, takes an input, and the other input, the second input, um, is a black and white image which tells the um, blur where to be blurry and where to be sharp um, so if working with this kind of blur I recommend to make it really high especially during authoring so you can actually see what's going on uh, this is not too good at the moment ah sorry um, and uh, we wire this into the output so uh, we can actually see the effect so now it doesn't really what we want to do so we can adjust this here um, we could do a lot of things here um, say how at which depths the, the blur starts to work um, what I dislike a bit is that through the sharp edges that we have here in the depth map, uh, if you apply the blur, it somehow doesn't look super natural. Um, and that's why I like to add in the whole mix um, a little ramp to uh, give me more control over where I want to have blur and where not. Uh, let's make a ramp, let's give it also like a 16 to 9 ratio and um, let's say to be like this uh, and add this to the thing. So now we can start to play around with this and see uh, where in space we want to have blur where not um, a nice variation of that is also um, in this case it would be probably well off to invert the whole thing let's do this uh,
again, this is um, so now I can use this to um, get additional control over the blur uh, in the scene. So for example I can blur it towards the edges um, So that would be um additional thing. A nice option also here is to add some noise. Which we could use to um which we could also add to this mix. Um I mean this is a bit extreme now. Like always is really very much a question of um, spending the time and adjusting all the settings so that the stuff starts to make really sense. I mean I can't really spend this time now but um, it's at the essence of doing this stuff. Let's add a level so we can also change this a little bit. Um, and if you um, now give this set value for example a little um, expression um, and divide that by 800 for example then get like a bit the effect that the uh, uh, blur is wandering around which also especially if it's a bit subtle gives the whole thing um, uh, a nice more um, lively atmosphere uh, but uh, every blur is also just as good as the sharp edge this somewhere else. Um, it's always good to check out how different operators look in the meantime, so let's see what happened to the SSAO. Is that still like in a good state or can we maybe achieve more better results uh, if we adapt it to the new conditions? And as we've got more texture in the scene, we also can basically hide more artifacts. Uh, in the best case it even gives the whole thing something like a structure which is nice because uh, we'll have the artifacts anyway. Um, also we can play around with the light a little bit and see if we can get more interesting situations. Something that we haven't done quite yet with the light also is um, so you can get much more dramatic if you want. Um, what we also can do with the light uh, what we haven't used yet is we can use distance attenuation. Uh, which will again allow us to put the brightness of the light uh, limited to a certain depth which we can also again use to tell a little bit something about the depth in our scene and uh, another thing that um, is always interesting to consider is if you change the projection so what I like to do is to go to perspective to auto blend which then allows me to blend um, between a perspective view and an autographic view. The autographic view basically needs here the width of the render. No. 
definitely a quite big number. Uh, what do we have here? 30. Something like this. So um, now we can basically go from a flat view to like the steps view. Don't quite get why it's so dark here uh, because it's so much shadows. Because now we're very much in the shadow and we get the whole lightning from the um, rim lights, probably. Yeah. There is uh, something like rim lights is basically cheating. It can be confusing if you also a 3D scene because uh, it does things that actually wouldn't happen in the room. So you have to be very much the painter that um, still takes care that the room is still kind of logical. Um, so I think if you turn on the rim lights, then it's basically dark as hell because we overdid it with uh, the lights. Um, let's see if this is the distance attenuation problem. Yeah. So all these value ranges should be used as soft as possible because the softer it is, the more uh, realistic or uh, spatial looks our image. Um, another thing is especially as we are so colorful now that we can do is we can use color correction and we should do that so um, let's add for example uh, luma level and that allows us to increase contrast um, to adjust gamma brightness but you have to be very careful uh, it's not so easy to get like a super good control over the colors in Touch Designer. There's also the um, HSV to uh, adjust node, which allows you to influence the colors, but also that is quite rude. I uh, find it easy to get easily good results out of it. Um, another interesting option that I recently found is uh, our LUTs lookup tables as they are used in the color correction like um, Adobe Lumetri color correction writes look tables you can download lots of look tables from the web and that's what I have done and um, I also created this little LUT browser for me uh, which allows me to look through the different look tables on my um, hard disk in here and see how they change the behavior of the scene. Uh, lookup tables are basically just uh, tables which tell um, how the colors of an image have to be shifted in a certain direction. You can think of them like um, Instagram filters basically. So you see that I can change the whole color scheme of the scene very easily by applying a lookup table. So this just goes through the lookup tables on my hard disk. I will put a few lookup tables um, with the uh, workshop file so that you can basically also see, apply them to the scene. So actually, I wouldn't go too far from the initial thing. The problem is also when you apply this while you work then um, every other decision that you make is based on what you see usually and then uh, that can be a bit deceiving so basically lots of these effects should be applied in the right order um, because they will influence everything else. You know, Now I have much more contrast so I would deal different with lights and stuff. Um, one thing that we can also use to make this look a bit more nicer, we can also try to work with soft 2D uh, shadows, but I find it usually very, very difficult to control. Um, but it will also make the whole scene look a bit more 
spatial. Again, you have to play around with the settings and find something that doesn't ruin your frame rate totally, but that helps to paint the scene with more depth. Um, um, a bit of time has passed since the last part of the recording um, because I had to figure out something and um, that is that I made a mistake with the texture coordinates. Um, I said uh, the range should stay from 0 to 1, but actually it needs to be adapted. So the talking here about the U coordinate. Um, our scenario is here. We got it from the grid um, and we range the range. So basically my thinking was it needs to be from 0 to 1 um, to cover the whole range but obviously it needs to be from um, 0 to 1 minus 1 divided by 32 um, and similar for the V coordinate it needs to be 1 minus 1 divided by 18 I haven't fully wrapped my head around why it is like that, but that's what we have to do. Uh, I'm sure you're going to figure it out, and me too, sooner or later. Um, so let's add a bit of texture to the whole thing. Um, as you can see, in the meantime, I've been also playing around a bit with the look, but I didn't do anything fundamental. Um, it just looks a little bit different. So let's get some textures in. Um, I've prepared an image uh, which is uh, also with the project files. Um, and this is grid 32 by 18. Um, let's give this as a specular map. Um, uh, let's put it as a diffuse map. You should be actually able to see it. And you see it gives, um, we have now like a bit of a black outline for each of the cubes. Um, another thing that we can do with, um, yeah, you can also, for example, take this and run it through a uh, level and map that and see how that will influence the whole scenery so you could go for a more um, virtual reality kind of style and also with this you get like quite some possibilities for fine-tuning the image um, you might also want to use this on another slot Let's give the specular ch chance again. Maybe we have to turn it on here. Um, let's see. Here we go. tiny bit more structure um, because now we can do something else with the diffuse map um, I'll import two other textures which you will also find with the project files um, this one and this one just some uh, random pictures and what we can do now is we can use the depth map uh, as a mat to assign these two different textures to different parts of the space. Uh, so we run the two of them in the mat node. And um, as a mask we feed what we get here from the null into it. Um, here we select luminance and we see it's very <laughs> soft now because it's like there has been not very many um, pixels and they're being 
softened so we turn this to nearest pixel and we see that this mixes already quite a bit and um, it's not very distinct and that is because um, texture is quite gray and that's uh, why we will add a thresh th threshold threshold uh, node which will give us a, a clear black and white decision which will also allow us to manipulate the texture in the scene and then can still be softened. Um, it works much better as a, a match can also be used with the alpha. Um, and now we get like a clear difference. So um, let's feed this into the diffuse map channel. And you see that the different parts of the image are mapped to the room and with the mat we can now basically let them travel beside where they are. Obviously you could also go in manually and when you soften the whole thing you get also interesting effects. Again you need to play with the settings. Mm, that is one more piece of eye candy that we can do with textures. Another one would be um, to add reflections to the whole thing. Um, for that we will add a render pass, um, feed it top, for that we will add another render um, and another camera. And we set the render to the new camera and set it to cube map, uh, which looks like this. Uh, and that means that the camera looks into the room, takes a 360 degree image, and that is being mapped on to the cubes. Now obviously we have kind of a fake geometry because of these walls, we don't have the best access with textures to that. But uh, nevertheless, it gives um, additional layer of complexity and when later when we move the camera and we move around, the reflections will also move around. Not necessarily correct, but they will give the impression of a reflection. So let's stop talking about this and apply this to the environment map slot of our material and you can already see stuff starts reflecting. Um, now you can adjust this the strength of the reflection with um, this gr shade of grey basically so maybe not too much but also not too little as always mm -hmm. okay uh, and now you can start playing with the position of the camera move it deeper in the scene try to get more of the reflections that you want can be interesting to rotate the whole thing a little bit. Um, again, we don't achieve total realism. We can possibly achieve something that just looks good. And now when I move the whole thing around a bit, um, you see that the reflections work. the magic. Okay, so that looks uh, kind of nice. Um, the last thing that we, I think, wanted to look into is um, how can we record the stuff so can we can really crank up the settings and don't think about the frame rate anymore but just render this out in the best quality possible um, 
and there's a few steps that we have to t have to take, um, but nothing too complicated. So first thing we do is um, towards the end we add a movie file out. Um, I recommend to set this to animation. Animation has the advantage that you can record almost uncompressed RGB or RGB in a alpha channel um, and it always worked for me. Like there's other options. Um, the one that also always worked is the photo motion JPEG, which is good for intermediate renders but um, and it produces much smaller file sizes. Animation is huge. Uh, but it also is compressed and we want to harvest when we render the full um, beauty of color that the catch designer can deliver. Um, the other things are also options but I recommend take animation and then later think about the encoding. For now we leave it with RGB because we don't have any transparencies anymore. Um, when we want to drive it with audio we have to connect the audio chop here and um, as we want to drive it with audio, that's maybe a good moment to introduce um, audio. Um, I tend to use the audio analysis like rack these days, um, which gives um, different values, but we only want um, the rhythm for now. Um, one thing that I also like to do is um, to have things not happening on every beat that is very hectic. So I have this method. I uh, introduce a count. That count uh, gets uh, a loop and then I can set basically the sensibility, how often it will react, uh, will it react on every eighth beat, or whatever. So often reset, when you change something here you have to reset because you get like a, uh, uneven values and uh, now okay this uh, counts from 0 to 8 and then I add a logic that um, is off when outside bounds, the outside bounds is between not 0 and 1, so now every once in a while I get the beat. Um, I run this through a filter and run this into a speed. Let's see what that does. creates some kind of smooth signal and uh, what could we do with this um, yeah we could use this to drive um, the ramps for example that have an influence on our geometry not at the moment we can turn it back on so let's take it to this ramp um, Give it something round so it actually loops um, and use the switch to bring it in a tiny bit. Where is it? It's not too much happening. Okay, here we see that it is um, basically moving through the loop with the beat. Um, maybe we can also use a little bit of that on the camera. Um, here is the filter 33. Here, 
so, so that's not bad. Um, so that would be the the one real time um, effect. Also, could be nice to have something and every beat happening to the light. a tiny bit no. um, and use this on the light to make it flash a little bit Maybe try something like that. Okay, looks quite Instagrammy. Um, look at the shadows. with the directions of the shadows. Okay, so this looks quite good. And the other thing that we might introduce is a um, simple slider um, as kind of a replacement for what could be um, a MIDI controller or something like that. Um, the thing is, when you record um an offline rendering with touch designer you need to turn real time off um and then it will render uh, take as much time as it needs for every frame until certain limits but you can go uh, quite far <coughs> and um but what that does is when you uh, control the scene in real time with midi or with slider or something then that information gets chopped up so um, what you have to do is basically run the scene once in real time um, and do the control record the controls that you do and then play that recording offline in sync with the scene and the music so you get smooth controller values. Um, sounds strange but we're gonna see when so now we have to think of something that we can do with this slider and uh, maybe we could think that this slider could be quite good to control the projection blend. It's a very mighty thing for one slider. So that would be then the effect this slider would have. Okay. Um so basically we get this data out here with still real time. Um we run this data into a record. Um and the easiest way to get all the things together and have to the time um all right is to know how long the music is which you find out with an info. Mm. So it says it is 4,218 frames long. So we set the timeline to 4,218 frames. Uh, and we set the audio file to play mode lock to timeline. So now basically will always start at the beginning of the timeline. Um, second. Uh, yeah, as we are here, we should use this uh, information to feed it to the um, movie file out. And that's the movie file out. Yeah. And connect. 
is not the audio that will give us, uh, will be recorded and give us also uh, the time. The movie uh, will be rendered at 30 FPS. Um, basically, we almost set, we would set the timeline to once. And uh, we now still in real time, we go once through the recording um, and simulate it basically. Uh, to record the action of the slider. This should be set to full range, exactly. Record is on. We go back to frame 1. Uh, we are set to play once. We are real-time. And off we go. Obviously my actions don't make the most sense, uh, it's really just to get some controller data. In. Actually as we are here, um, I really like this uh, isometric look, especially with the shadows um, and some lights, because it still gives somehow a feeling of space, but on the other hand it's really flat. and. Um, I really like the look. The only thing you would have to get rid of if you want to use that is that black dot in the middle. That's basically the SSAO, which yeah doesn't work in the autographic view. So if you would really want to do something like this, where you switch from perspective to autographic, you would also have something that overrides the SSAO to avoid this uh, black. So. Uh, Basically, we've gone through it once, so um, now we should save these channels uh, into the channel folder as record one. Um, to run this properly in sync with the time, uh, we're gonna load this back in. No, it wasn't default one. Um, it was here where I recorded it to. Record one. Uh, and we're gonna run this through a lookup table. And the lookup table takes um, the lookup table, which is a recording, and it takes an index. Uh, and this index um, should be the time. Um, and to achieve that, we're going to use a timer object. I'm sure there's lots of other, maybe better ways to do it, but um, this works for me. I lock it to timeline. I give it the length of the scene, so 280 frames. And uh, we're gonna start it with the recording. And this generates a uh, timer fraction. We can limit it here to only give us timer fraction. And timer fraction is basically the time as a value between 0 and 1, exactly what the lookup needs. So now the lookup will give us um, the actions of timer. So we can try this by. Starting basically, if we connect this to a trail to see what's going on, it should reproduce the things that we have done. Okay, so um, we can pause this, set this to. Mm. Um, is locked with the timeline, so basically it works with the timeline. Um, we can turn real time off. Uh, so uh, we have to hook this up uh, now that we have it. Um, we could now say, okay, we insert a switch here to have a 
way to introduce this value instead of the manual slider value. So now we don't get this anymore, but we get this. Um, in sync with the timeline, we have turned real time off. Um, we go to the movie file out. We turn record on. And one thing which is really uh, good to do is um, if you save the scene after rendering, which is a good idea because if you want to revisit it, you want to know which was the exact scene that you rendered. Um, so what I do is immediately after recording, I turn the record button off and save the scene and then move on with another name. Um, if you open the file and the record is still on, it will immediately override your nice recording. So before you save, always turn record off. Now turn record on. Back to once, you set on once. Um, let's check where it saves. Should save here into movie. Could save here. Right, override the one from yesterday. And go. And you can see this is still uh, relatively mild uh, because it's only 1280 by 720 and I didn't crank up the SSAO settings too much as you can see here on the sides. Um, as we are rendering with Touch Designer we might still be picks and uh, do it while we render. See how that goes. Um, And you see that we are still rendering with 50 frames, so that's not too bad. Another thing that we could do to um, make our render nicer is to uh, work here with higher anti-aliasing. Um, that should definitely have an effect. And now we're done, so I go on uh, first of all to the movie file out and turn off record. Because now the, the movie file is really saved. I'm going to save this um, and let's have a look at our recording. Here it is. Uh, let's make the playback locked to timeline. Should have the same length. Let's see what an info says. Mm -hmm. 2109. Oh yeah, okay, that's because uh, it was 4080. At 60 frames per second, we recorded at 30 frames per second, so it's only half the frames. That makes sense. Um, and that is our recording. Obviously, it's much better to run the scene at uh, 30 frames when you record it at 30 frames or run it at 60 frames when you record it at 60 frames. Um, but I didn't think about that now, and now it's too late. Now the film is rendered. Um, I think the result is okay. Obviously, the shadows could get some more treatment, um, the function that turns off the SSAO, and so on. There's always uh, room for cream, basically. Um, so, that uh, was uh, the workshop. I hope I didn't leave out too much that we had in the workshop, but that was also a lot of hours. So, I think together with the scene file, there's um, a lot of things that you can actually play around. Um, I thank you for your attention um, and hope to see you soon at the next Touch Designer Summit. Bye bye.